Coming on to our 15th one, I hope you people are getting excited. I'm getting excited listening to what Mel has to introduce us to because we're stuttering now to fill in those pieces. This is something we've always wondered. What do you do between the 7th and 8th century when Islam starts to form? Why was it forming? Where was it forming? Who was it in process? And what were the people or what was the way or what were they using to form who they are? Well, from, from the last episode, we, we saw that it looks like this Muhammad is something that both Jews and Christians used as an authority figure. It was a title. It has been a title. It's right there through the Old Testament. It's there from the fourth century on by Ambrose in the Christian community as both Jesus referring to Jesus and for the Jews referring to the Messiah who is yet to come. That anticipation for the Messiah who is yet to come. So both the Jews and the Christians are waiting for this Muhammad. One to return, one to come for the first time. The Arabs who are from the Ishmaelite environment, who are who are now trying to create a whole new sect, not Jewish, not Christian, yet they are in they're certainly in alliance with them. They need something that will compete with what they are waiting for, or something that could answer what the Jews and the Christians have. So what we're gonna to do today now, and this is where we're gonna kind of end it off in this whole series. Uh, Mel's come on board. Thanks, Mel, for coming on board again. Uh, you're gonna be introducing a guy named Benjamin of Tudela. I've never heard this guy before. I have no idea what you're gonna say. What I'm hearing is gonna be the first time, just like for you, is the first time. Over to you, Mel. What is it you have to offer us today? Okay, so we, we've been given the standard Islamic narrative, there's hadiths and we have seerahs and so forth, but wouldn't it be amazing if we would go back in time, centuries after Islam began, and take a peek at what is actually happening on the ground, and actually just confirm that everything is as we imagine it was back in those days. That's what we're going to look at today. Benjamin of Tudela was a Jew who went on an epic journey all over Europe, the Middle East. He went to Arabia, he went to Baghdad, he traveled all over and he wrote notes. And because he was Jewish, he had access to places that we could only dream of accessing. So for example, he could go to the all the key religious places in Baghdad, no problem. And the story he tells us blew my mind when I first read it. And, and I'm still trying to filter what it, what it all means um, it's definitely going to change everyone's idea of what Islam was like in the first few centuries because it's telling a completely different story. So without further ado, I'm going to open up the slides here. So Benjamin of Tudela, as I mentioned, he's a Jew. Uh, he was living in Spain, he traveled all over uh, the known world at that time. And uh, he was living in the 12th century. His journey lasted from 1165 to 1173, so that would be an eight year journey. You can see from the map where he traveled. Um, he went to all the significant places really at that time. Uh, what's interesting, Jay, um, of all the places he traveled to, do you notice that there's one place he didn't go to? That's right. He didn't go the to- The one place he should have gone would be Mecca. Why is it, why didn't he get yeah. that? <laughs> he doesn't go to Mecca. Why not? He got, well, he's like, he you, goes to. <laughs> I can tell you why, because there are no Jews or Christians that far south. Yeah, well, it could be that, but it also it's indicates that Mecca was not a, either didn't exist or wasn't a thing at that time. Probably it wasn't that significant at that time. Um, but in any case, before it's interesting. Further, before you go any further, are you saying that 11, the 12th century Mecca was not important? Yes, exactly. And I, in oh, fact, oh. this is what, <laughs> this is I'm what we're going to discover that yet and you're already out on a limb to say that okay folks that's from mel's mouth let's see if yeah. it's correct because he's not just putting mecca of course it would have been existed but he's saying it's still not even important by the 12th yeah. century see this folks yeah we're finding and almost a lot of stuff we're finding now looks like we it is coming out of the ottoman period redacted back to the abbasid and the umayyad yeah. period. so mel may be what? correct but hold on let's yeah. see we're going, to see, we're going to see an example of a really clumsy interpolation in his text to try and fit Mecca back in. It's really obvious. There's a cut in, a, in the sentence, and it's trying to break up the fact that what he's telling us is where the Muslims are going is Baghdad to see the Caliph. 
who they see as Muhammad. That's the key clincher that we will see now in a, in a moment. So, so here he he goes to visit um, Baghdad, and he reveals an unusually close relationship between the Caliph and the Exilarch in the 12th century. What I've always been told is the Jews and the Muslims fell out sometime after the beginnings of Islam, and you know they became mortal enemies. But he tells us a completely different story. He says. There in Baghdad, the great king Al Abbasi, the Caliph Hafiz, holds his court and he is kind unto Israel, right? And many belonging to the people of Israel are his attendants. So there's a mutual uh, respect that's there. He says, now this is the Caliph, he knows all languages, well, he's exaggerating just a touch there, and is well versed in the law of Israel. He reads and writes the holy language, Hebrew. So this guy, um is very friendly towards israel he can speak he hebrew he even knows the law of israel which is amazing who'd have thought um and do, do stop me jay at any point in this um he goes on to say there are 10 battle and name which is administrators and they do not engage in any other work than communal administration and all of the days of the week they judge the jews their countrymen except on the second day of the week when they all appear before the chief rabbi Samuel, the head of the Yeshiva Gaon, which is the Jewish Academy, who in conjunction with the other uh, Battle Anim judges all those that appear before him. And at the head of them all is Daniel, the son of his day. Do you remember that name, his day, from the last episode? Uh, this is so that that is from that family line um, from the Boston A line there who is styled our Lord, the head of the captivity of all Israel. He possesses a book of pedigrees going back as far as David, king of Israel. The Jews call him our Lord, head of the captivity, and the Mohammedans call him Sadne bin Daoud, descendant of David. So they recognize this exilarch as being important. And he has been invested with authority over all the congregations of Israel at the hands of the Emir al Muminin the Lord of Islam. Do you want to come in on any of that, Jay? Oh, Shall I continue? On. Now, this is the clincher. Um, he, we'll see evidence that the Caliph is regarded by the Muslims as Muhammad. Big, big uh, reveal here. The men of Islam see him, the Caliph, but once in the year. The pilgrims that come from distant lands. Now, I'm just going to go from bold to bold here, just to show you that there's an interpolation in between. The pilgrims that come from distant lands um, are anxious to see his face and they assemble before the palace exclaiming, our Lord, light of Islam, the glory of our law, show us the affluence, sorry, show us the effulgence of thy countenance. Now you notice that there's this passage in between, they obviously had to do something with that text. They, they come from distant lands to go onto Mecca, which is in the land El Yemen. Um, AJ Juice believes that this is a really clumsy interpolation to, to put Mecca into the text where it wasn't. Okay. And the Caliph pays no regard to their words. Then he, then the princes who minister unto him say to him, Our Lord, spread forth thy peace unto the men that have come from distant lands who crave to abide under the shadow of thy graciousness. Therefore he arises and lets down the hem of his robe from the window and the pilgrims come and kiss it. And a prince says unto them, go forth in peace for our master, the Lord of Islam granted peace to you. He is regarded by them as Muhammad, right? So we're talking about chain of Muhammad's. Here it is in black and white from the 12th century. He is regarded by the Muslims as Muhammad and they go to their houses rejoicing at the salutation which the prince has vouchsafed unto them and glad at heart that they have kissed his robe. So for them, that was the um, Hajj, to go and see the Caliph, who they believe is the Shekinah, you know, God's holy presence on earth. That's that's what they, they believed, which comes straight from Judaism, the idea that the Jews thought the Exilarch was um, God's holy presence on earth. Muhammad, or the figure of the Caliph, took on a similar role for the the for the Muslims 
So you had a dual government where the exilarch had all the political power and the caliph had the religious power and his job was just to teach the Muslims their religious beliefs. Um, do you want to jump in on that, Jay? Yeah, and obviously you're saying that this was in lieu of going to Mecca. That's why they had to put Mecca there in Yemen. Uh, in, in, that's interpolation, a later interpolation is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah there's a big there's a big question mark over it. Um, perhaps there was no, you know, this is where AJ Juice would could maybe differ with some others. Um, you know, it's possible that there was no pilgrimage yet to Mecca, at the, even at the 12th century. Um, the 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 what this text seems to suggest that it was all about going to Baghdad and visit the caliph. That was what they the weren't interested in a building, a rock. It was all about a human being who they believed was God on earth, or at least the holy presence of God on earth. That was what it was for them. Um, so uh, he goes on to say that the pilgrims that come from distant lands are anxious to see his face. And the assembly before the palace exclaiming our lord light of islam and glory of our law show us the effulgence of thy countenance but he pays no regard to their works he is regarded by them as muhammad and they go to their houses rejoicing at the salutation which the prince has vouchsafed unto them and glad at heart that they have kissed his robe so you can see that the caliph is the focus of their pilgrimage and he's regarded by them as muhammad um and then it goes on to say, for thus Muhammad commanded concerning him and his descendants, and he granted him a seal of office over all the congregations that dwell under his rule, and ordered that every one, whether Mohammedan or Jew, or belonging to any other nation in his dominion, should rise up before him, the exilarch, and salute him, and that anyone who should refuse to rise up should receive 100 stripes. So it's suggesting that there was a tradition um, at that time that the original um, beginner of this, whether it is Marzutra II or whether it was Nehemiah bin Huziel, but they set off a, a tradition where they, they had a dual government between the, the Jews and the Muslims. And the deal was that uh, Muslims, the Mohammedans, had to show due respect to the exilarch and salute him. And if they didn't, they were to get a hundred stripes, like a hundred whips or a hundred uh, smacks of a, of, a, of a cane for not doing that. Um, so as further evidence for this, this is a postscript. Now, this is not from uh, uh, Benjamin of Tudela. Shia refers to a group of Muslims who believe that the succession to Muhammad must remain in his family for specific members who are designated by a divine appointment. A vast majority of Twelvers often add uh, Aliyun Waliyu uh, La La. Ali is the vice regent of God at the end of the Shahada. So unlike the, the regular Shahada, they have Ali is the vice regent of God. This testifies that Ali is also the leader of the believers along with God and Muhammad. So you have in their Shahada, I hope this makes sense, you have Allah, you have Muhammad and you have Allah, right? This reflects what um, Benjamin of Tudela is seeing. He's seeing a dual government where you obviously they're worshiping Allah, but they also have um, an exilarch and uh, a caliph who's acting as Muhammad. So that would suggest that Ali is actually the exilarch and the caliph is the Muhammad in this dual government, if that makes sense. When Benjamin of Tudela visited Baghdad, the caliph was treated as if, uh, as it were, as Muhammad, and the exilarch was treated as the vice regent, i.e. the official administrative deputy of the caliph, i.e. Ali. So the exilarch had way more power, believe it or not, than the caliph, which leads me to question if we, if we were even close in terms of understanding this early history, because I would have thought the caliph had more power at this time, but the, the caliph actually could only come out once a year. Uh, he was essentially just a figurehead. His, his job was to rule on religious matters, whereas the exilarch was the political leader. So um, now this go system of government lasted, I would, I would say, until the arrival of the Mongols. 
Okay, and this ended this partnership between the Jews and the Muslims. Muslims. Over about twelve hundred. Um, yeah, it, this would have been around 1219, 1219, yeah. So the Genghis Khan declared war in 1219, and the Mongols overran the empire, occupying the major cities and population centers between 1219 and 1221. Iran was ravaged by the Mongol detachment under Jebe and Sabute, who left the area in ruin. Uh, Transoxiana also came under Mongol control after the invasion. Um, so, so essentially, that was the period when this political relationship ended, um, and it is really only remembered in Shiaism. Um, it, and the interesting thing is the Shias still yearn for the, the arrival of the Mahdi, which which uh, put back in place this what they consider um, uh, like a golden period in their history, where everything was peaceful and they had this uh, rule of law between the Exilarch and the um, the Caliph. So uh, with that, I'm going to just come back to you there. I think that's it. Well, you are putting, you are throwing an awful <laughs> lot uh, at this, at us in this last bit here. And I'm, I'm not sure I'm fully on board with it, but I'm going to go with what you're saying. And the reason why is uh, we've always said uh, here on Fander Films, uh, you said so on origins. We go back to the origins. When you go back to the origins, you follow the evidence that's on the ground. At least what AJ Dios has done and what you're doing here, you're following the evidence that we're seeing that you can put together from the ninth and the 10th going on up to, in this case, the 1200s or the 13th century. Is it that there is this companionship, this compatibility between the Arabs or the Muslims and the Jews where you have a political figure and you have a religious figure who are kind of cohabiting and co-working alongside, this goes against everything we see in the standard Islamic narrative. It's not what we what anybody has heard before. Uh, this is the first I'm hearing it. I don't know exactly how we're going to go with it, but you're the first to really introduce it. So this is an introduction. This starts out a whole new area of study. Not only the origins of Islam, we're now going into how Islam then finally came into its final form and where and how did we now get the Islam we have today. Up till today, I've always said it's the Abbasids who created the Islam. You're mm -hmm. suggesting, intimating, you and A.J. Deus are saying it's not only the Abbasids because when we look at the Abbasid period, up until the Mongols come and destroy everything, and that has to be then resettled from uh, from the Ottomans, it looks like what you're saying is it may not be the Islam of the Abbasids that we have today. It may be the Islam of the Ottomans. Now, as a caveat, and I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to say too much more. Is We're going to be putting up in a few days, about, about a week or two from now, we're going to be putting up the material on when the earliest extant manuscripts we have for all of these, what we've assumed would, would be Abbasid writers. Ibn Sa'd, Ibn Isak, Al, uh, Ibn Hisham, Al-Wakiri, Sahih Muslim, uh, uh, Al-Buhari, Tirmidhi, Ibn Daud, all of these from Al-Tabari, every one of these household names we have always said were Abbasid writers. You and I have said that. This is what everybody else seems to be saying. The extant manuscripts suggests completely different. The extant manuscripts for every one of those names do not appear at all. None of these manuscripts by any of these writers, by any of these compilers, are from the 8th or the 9th or the 10th century. I might say one thing, there is one from 950, but that's about it. After that, almost everything we know about any of these writers comes from the Ottoman period and even later. So, well, from the Ottoman period, I'll just leave it at that, much, much later. So the extant manuscript do support what you're saying here. Do support what you're saying here. But this is, you're chewing, you're cutting off an awful lot here. You're chewing something that I'm not really, really <laughs> uh, ready to swallow yet. And uh, I'm going to yeah, chew. No, We're going to continue to come back on it. But that's how we look at history. We don't redress history. We don't remake history. We see what history can tell us. And that's exactly what we've asked you to do. AJ Deuce and you are doing this. Audon has come alongside you. This is exciting. This is fun. This is a real white paper. You're putting down your gauntlet here and you're saying, this is a new idea, folks. It may not sit well with you. It doesn't quite sit well with me yet. I'm not willing to go there yet. 
Nonetheless, the fact that you have supported it by looking at documents from that time period, by looking and seeing what was happening in that time period, the fact that there was a good relationship between the Jews and the Arabs as late as 1200s, woo, two, 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 two. Wow, this is new. This is difficult. You have to swallow. <laughs> and yet, maybe we're going to have to do so if that's where the evidence leads. And we've always demanded we need to follow the evidence on the ground. Great stuff. Listen, I'm excited. Let's see where it goes. You people, you have the, the comments below. Let's see what you think. Are you ready to swallow this this quickly, or do you still want some more evidence? We're going to be kind of unpiling more. Uh, you can bet that Mel and Dios, AJ Dios, are going to continue to unpack. And remember, we've always said, the more they scratch, the more they find. The more they find, the more they whine. The more they whine, the more we shine. Oh, how sublime. We've always started from that premise. Folks, the more you unpack things, pull up the different rocks, pull up the different gravestones, pull up the stand in the desert and look and see what's underneath. What you're going to find, may not, you may not like, and you, it may shine or make you whine. Nonetheless, folks, we've got to go with where they what they're telling us. And if we're not going to cry out, then the rocks are going to cry out for us. God bless you, Mel. Thanks so much. This has been a great series. Uh, we'll continue on with more yet to come. This is Jay here in the United States, Mel in Europe. Over and out.